We're pleased to have with us our speaker. If I could have you come up to the pulpit. <laughs> this He tells me that this is the first time you're preaching in English? Yeah. <laughs> the first time he's preaching in English. His native, how many languages do you speak? Uh, five languages. He speaks so five, can you imagine? And uh, what is your life work, sir, brother? Could you repeat that? Your, your, what kind of work do you do? I'm a teacher in Hartford Public Schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I assist uh, my students over there. Mm -hmm. And your home church is? Uh, Hartford Portuguese Church. Hartford Portuguese yes. Church. So his name, if you don't know, is David Benjamin, right? Is that correct? No, ben. David ben. ben. And uh, Dave means uh, beloved, and uh, Ben is son of my strength or son of my right hand. <laughs> it's a very beautiful name. Thank you. And, and Swan is a swan. <laughs> swan, yes, yeah, swan, as in the yeah. bird, the yeah. beautiful bird. <laughs> so we welcome Brother Sw Swantes? Swantes to our pulpit today. Thank you. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. The New Testament was originally written in Greek, which by the time of Christ was a widely spoken language throughout the old world, with a stages somewhat comparable to that of English in the modern era. In the original language, the word translated here as know carries the sense of recognizing or truly understanding something or someone. Therefore, the original text reads, I recognize my sheep, or I understand my sheep, and my sheep recognize me, or my sheep understand me. If we take the time to read the te this text slowly and carefully, Delving deeper into its meaning, my entire sermon this morning could focus on it alone. After all, truly understanding our shepherd in his unique nature is quite an ambitious task, isn't it? It's not exactly easy, is it? Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life, for the sheep. Here, Jesus, the extraordinary preacher, continues by saying, Cago ginosco tom patera. I know the Father. In this context, the combination of these two words, know and Father, has the potential to bewilder even the most thoughtful mind. In the original language of the Old Testament, Father is translated as Pater or Patera, which means ancestor or biological father. The issue here is that Jesus is applying this word to Almighty God Himself. How is that possible? Can any finite creature truly understand the Eternal? Can an infinite mind fully know him? Yet, Jesus says he knows him. Unless Jesus himself shares the same divine nature as the Father, his statement, I know the Father, would make little sense, much like a teenager who has never fathered anyone yet trying to speak about parenthood. I am a language teacher as you know, and part of the modern curriculum for language teaching in high schools in America requires us to teach students how to gather evidence from the texts they study. So what stunning evidence do we find in this passage from John 10, 14 and 15? What do Jesus' words reveal about his true identity? We already know, don't we? We know. Jesus is both fully man and fully God. While being completely human, he is also the perfect God. 
the infant of Bethlehem is the creator of all things. The Lamb of God is no less than the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Yes, Jesus is both the servant of servants and the King of kings. He is the one who was tempted by the devil, yet also the one whom the angels themselves delighted to serve. He died on a cross, yet he is life. He is life. Do we truly understand him? Do we recognize him as our God? I tell you the truth, our identity as his sheep depends on this. I'm not supposed to invent new words here. I'm a foreigner. But if I had to invent one for this context, I would speak to you about sheephood. Something that would refer to our identity as a sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. I would love to spend more time reflecting on this particular verse and discussing it further. But not today. I would require a separate message to do it justice. Perhaps another time. From the verses 17 to 41, Jesus continues to reveal his divine nature and his unique relationship with the Father. Who is the giver of all life? Who possesses the authority over life to do as he pleases, if not God himself? Theologically speaking, the text of the Gospel of John serves as an apologetic work, meaning it provides an explanatory defense of a specific point. But what is the point? The Gospel of Matthew aimed to demonstrate that Jesus was the Messiah for, for whom the Jews had long awaited. The Gospel of Mark sought to establish that Jesus was the sacrifice offered by God himself to redeem humanity. The Gospel of Luke focused on highlighting, highlighting the teachings of Jesus, showcasing the power of beauty of his message. What about the Gospel of John? The, purpo the purpose of the Gospel of John is not just to show, but also to argue and provide evidence that Jesus is God. That's what it's all about, my brothers and sisters. Jesus is God. In a world as strange as the one we live in today, where history is continually revised, traditions are ignored, established principles are challenged and replaced for no satisfactory reason, and even truth is relativized and debated, it's incredibly comforting to find safety in the space provided by the Seventh-day Adventist Church to proclaim loudly and clearly, Jesus is God. But what is the significance of recognizing Jesus, recognizing Jesus as God? What does it mean to understand that our shepherd is God himself? Does this change anything to us? How does it impact our everyday lives? Please listen carefully to what I'm about to ask. If Jesus is God and He is God, shouldn't His commandments and teachings be taken more seriously and even literally in our daily lives? Oh, come on. What is this Brazilian talking about? We are seventh day Adventists. Surely we take Jesus' word seriously. And his teachings aren't exactly new to us, right? We keep the Sabbath holy. 
We abstain ourselves from unhealthy, unhealthy foods and drinks. We set aside our tithe and offerings, and so on. So what's the point of this question? We know everything. Well, as a K-12 teacher, I know from experience that certain assignments given to my 12th graders could never be accomplished or yelled quality results unless those students have satisfactorily completed the 9th, 10th, and 11th grade instruction. We cannot expect to achieve certain desired outcomes if we ignore the processes that lead us there. Christian life, discipleship, and our identity as sheep, sheephood, depend on our commitment to Jesus' instructions. The primary instructions that came from the mouth of Jesus himself. The proposal of being part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Seventh-day Adventist movement, is to reproduce by grace the experiences of those men and women who listened to Jesus' words, recognized Him as God Himself, and unreservedly followed Him into a life that required giving up control of their destinies to fully embrace God's plan for each of them and for each of us. Christian life, discipleship, and our identity as sheep also depend on our understanding that some commandments given to us are literal. Literal means that the words used by Christ, Christ mean exactly what they say. In recent history, we have witnessed strange occurrences in this odd world. References and priorities have shifted. While it might be acceptable for these changes to happen outside the church, far from the children of present truth, we must honestly examine our surroundings and our own hearts. Jesus' initial lessons have often been ignored and replaced with other goals that have lived no, that have little to do with Christ's original mission, even among our people. This foreign body, known as theology of domination, suggests that Seventh-day Adventists should infiltrate parliaments and congressional halls worldwide to enact laws and govern this world according to God's will. However, this idea has no foundation in the teachings of him who said, My kingdom is not from this world. It's not of this world. John 18, 36. This strange doctrine leads many modern Adventists to strive for temporal prosperity under the misleading claims of the prosperity gospel. All in an attempt to gain influence over the world. This is a trap. As Jesus said to a rich man, a rich young man once, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Matthew 19, 21. He also stated, it's easier for a camel, a camel to, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So, what's this about? Why? What, what is the theology, the prosperity theology, making its way into our churches? Behold, my brothers and sisters, the ways and strategies of the world are wrong and unacceptable to the interests of true discipleship in Christ. The time has come for us to carefully examine, examine our commitment to the fundamentals of Christian life. 
and our identity as children, which simply involves listening to Jesus' words, the literal words of our God. Which words, you may ask? Which exactly words? Jesus spoke about so many different things. He covered a plethora of subjects during his life. John himself said that he cared to write about all the things that Jesus said and did. Not even the entire world would be enough to keep all the books that would be written, right? But there are certain words that are there, that are shining from the scripture, straight to our faces. Matthew 22, 37, for example. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And I could stop over here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with your, all your might. And with this verse, as Christians, we have our plates full, right? Completely full. Because it would absorb our entire lives. Everything that is in us. Matthew 22, 39. He's not satisfied yet. He needs us to go beyond that. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. In American culture, things go a little different than in Brazilian culture, for example. I have noticed since I moved to the United States that we are not very close to our neighbors. In my country, your neighbors knock your, your door early in the morning, they go into your, your kitchen, they borrow things, we know about their lives, they know about our lives, and we are all together. Sometimes we understand them as family as well. And if one of us gets sick, the others are there. Such are things in my culture. It's not better than here. It's just different than it is here. Because there are some inconveniences that I'm not likely to mention here. But it's like that. And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. How can I love somebody whom I don't know? Let's talk about our churches. How am I expected to love my neighbor if I don't know him or her? If I don't know them? If I don't hear about the, their struggles, their fears, their desires, their dreams, their frustrations? If I'm not if I'm not open to hear about their broken hearts, about their claims, about their shames. But Jesus' goal goes beyond. He says more. He doesn't stop there. We have enough, but he continues. And he says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45, Love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in, he in heaven. Love your enemies. That's too much. That's too much. To pray for those who persecute us? Well, I have a couple of stories about that. I have lived in different countries through the years. I have met many people. Not all of them were pleasant, <laughs> pleasant acquaintances, but it happens. I had to deal with some people who were very difficult and even mean people sometimes. And I have taken this perhaps seriously. Pray for, your, for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. And in the lack of a better word in my vocabulary to refer to this, there was magical, miraculous. I have seen extraordinary things through the years. I have seen enemies of mine 
coming forth in public to say, this is a good man. This is, David is a good man. I was so wrong. Pray for your enemies. Love them. In this culture, we have been told to defend ourselves, to do whatever is needed to defend our property, our families, our interests. And it seems like we live here in a continuous fight to survive. But what about Jesus' teachings? If Jesus is God and those teachings are literal, what are we supposed to do with them? It's constraining to face Jesus' words when it comes to real life. Right? It's constraining. How can I love those people who hate me? Who continually, continuously try to harm me? Are we speaking about our neighbors that sometimes park in the wrong side? Or are we speaking about the terrorists that threaten our churches? our schools, our country. Who are our enemies? But Jesus says, it doesn't matter. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Luke chapter 6, verse 35, about the same topic, clarifies things by saying, Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. I like this part. You will be children of the Most High because he is kind and he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. We who have children feel flattered many times when our children repeat us. When they copy our best qualities, when they reproduce our virtues, right? If my son gets interested in languages, I will be flattered about that. It's something I love. If my son starts liking literature and talking about literature, about Charles Dickens, William Shakespeare, Mark Twain, I will be very proud of him. Sometimes they repeat us in our mistakes, in our defects, in our bad qualities as well. But when we decide to be kind to the ungrateful and wicked, we are repeating our Father in heaven. We look like him. Actually, there are three things that a human being does that can be taken as evidence that this person belongs to the family of God. When we love unselfishly, that says a lot about us, because God does that. When we create new things, because God is creator, it means that we, we have descended somehow from him. And when we forgive, if we go to the point of forgiving unforgivable things, oh, oh, it will say so much about us. Because our Father was put on a cross and they were saying bad things about him using coarse language, they meant what they were saying. They were there to kill him, and they did. And he turns up his eyes and says, he looks up and says, Father, forgive them, 
because they don't know what they do. When we forgive, we remember and remind others that we are children of our Father in heaven. Jesus' words are literal, but there is more. We are speaking about love as something abstract that is not very clear. What's loving your enemies after all? What, what does that mean? And Jesus teaches us in more proper, concrete terms in Matthew 25, verses 35, 35 to 40. When he speaks about the judgment day in a clear language, he says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. In the verse 40, he says, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That is love. It's not about embracing people on the streets. It's not about send, sending Valentine cards to your enemies. It's about deciding to do good to those who do not deserve goodness. It's about forgive those who do not deserve our forgiveness. It's about accepting the teachings and the lifestyle of Jesus to reproduce it in our lives. All these words of Jesus and other ones, other words too, are literal. Do you remember what literal means? They are literal. They are saying exactly what they say. They mean exactly what they say. They are literal words. Sometimes I come to this strange place in which all, our, all of us humans come sometime. I, I'm praying and then I turn to God and said, Oh Lord, you know that I forgive everything, don't you? You know, you taught me this. I'm able to forgive everything because you told me that if I forgive everything, you also you would also forgive me. And I have this image of God in my mind that he looks at me the same way I look to my son when he does something that really pleases me. Whenever I pray like that, I feel like myself looking at Gabriel and telling him, Oh man, this is my son. This is my son. I feel God does the same when we openly love and when we forgive. Even when those things go against our nature. These words of Jesus are literal. They were spoken by Jesus himself for our instruction. And praised be the Lord, Jesus is God. Old Father Abraham once listened to the heard the voice of God at least thrice he heard the voice of God in very clear terms terms. In those three times, God always required things that were not easy for Abraham to do. First time, leave the land of your father, of your family, and go to a, a land that I will show you. You know nothing about it. You don't know what you are going for, but I will show you a land where you are to live. First word there was, live. Give up of this lifestyle that you have among your family. I've got something different for you somewhere. Just come. 
Second time the voice of God came to him, he said, Give ears to your wife. Let the boy go away with his mother. And it was Abraham's son. And it caused the pain in Abraham's Abraham's what Abraham Abraham's heart because it was his firstborn son. But God told him to do that, and he obeyed. And the truth had been said that it was enough. He surrendered everything, right? But then, all of a sudden. The Lord comes again to speak to Abraham and says to him, Abraham, do you remember the other son? It's all that's left to you now. Do you remember him? Yes. I want you to take him. Take him to a mountain and he will sacrifice the boy on my behalf. What would we do if God asked us to do such an awful thing, because by that time, something that really differentiated the, the God of Abraham from other gods was that the God of Abraham did not make use of human sacrifice. He was different. Other cultures, other religions made use of human sacrifice. They killed innocent children. You know, Abraham was, he was hearing the voice, a very known voice, the familiar voice of God, telling him to do exactly what he didn't expect him to say. But Abraham did hear. Is Jesus asking us to do such an awful thing? Is that, is that really so hard to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, to dedicate more to God with all our hearts and mind and everything? If we assume, if we understand that Jesus is God, aren't all his orders to be followed and taken heartily? Because we know that we are serving God, the Almighty God. Do we understand that Jesus is God? Do we recognize him as our God? Because if we do, we will be prone to make some sacrifices sometimes. We will accept, we will, we will take discomfort. We will take risks. We will be committed to his will. I hope that someday, in the records of heaven regarding the Seventh-day Adventist Church of Portland, we will find a similar account as in John 10, 42, which reads, And in that place, many believed in Jesus. That's my prayer. That's my prayer. That someday about this day, we can say, and in that place, we can read in that place, many believed in Jesus. Because from now on, my brothers and sisters, if we believe in Jesus, it means that certain changes have to take place in our lives. Priorities dreams, pursuit of happiness. Some things will have to be changed that better things can take place in us. I have a final question. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit will be poured over the people of God prior to his coming? Do you believe that? 
Do you really believe that? Let's open our hearts wide to receive such a gift. Let's stay firm. Let's stay firm. Let's seek for the Lord as he can be found. And let's start obeying literally the words of Jesus, especially concerning all those things related to love and serving all the people, the least ones that are around us. Let's start putting on focus those things that deserve to be on focus. God's will, Jesus' commandments. And let's see what we will be doing in our lives, through our lives, and also in us. And in that place, many believed. Jesus. I bless you, my brothers and sisters. I bless you. I bless you in the name of God, of Jesus Christ, the desire of ages, the one who has granted us eternal life through his death and resurrection. I bless you. And I know that the Lord is going to hear I bless you. That's why to bring this short sermon to an end, because my English was all wasted today. I have used my entire English today. I would like to invite you to say a prayer together. Let's stand up to pray. Heavenly Father, Daddy, we trust you. We have seen the light by far when we decided to follow you, when we decided to better know you. We heard things, we saw some things, we became witnesses, but as passerbys. What we want now is to become witness out of our own experience. Please, power your spirit on us. Give us our, your gifts. Use us. Increase our faith. Increase our love. Put in our hearts the ambition of service and help us clearly think, see the things that you want for us. Break all the arguments that the world has used to allure us. Show us the truth about your will and use us. Please use us. Enable us to love our enemies, because we can't do that by ourselves. Enable us to forgive. And let your, your kingdom start in our hearts. Make this church a shining point that attracts the view of the angels. That make those same angels to come here to protect this community, but also to inspire it. Let our brothers and sisters feel blessed, but also feel committed to your truth. It's all that we ask and thank. In Jesus' name, the desire of ages. Amen.